Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Well, welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I've got a special guest today. He's been on ABC, NBC, every all over the place. He's done 10,000 independent uh, coaching sessions with executives. He has uh, written several books, his newest, and, co- and co-written several books. But one of them I want to touch on today is One Belief Away. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some specific things. One, you know, He's got a five-step strategy for getting unstuck. And uh, there's a whole lot more we could say. But welcome, Tim Schur. Uh, David, it is such an honor and a treat to be with you today. Well, thank you for just being a part of our Trusted Leader Show and our Trusted Leader audience, and I think we've got some great things in store today. Before we get right into it, which we like to do, maybe a couple more things just about you. Yes, so I think the one thing that allows me to stand out uh, is that I've been a hypnotist for the last 30 years, and so I started out uh, trying to figure out how to get rid of anxiety how to get rid of the worries and the stress and the self-sabotage or the imposter syndrome or those, you know, I wanted to be a top performer. I wanted to excel. I wanted to make the world a better place. But on the flip side of that is all that internal pressure, self-doubt, insecurity that we all experience from time to time. And I wanted to figure out how do you shift that? How do you get out of your own way? And so I went to school for psychology, but I found that talk therapy was very slow. You could sometimes go to school for, or go to a counselor for 10 years and not feel any better. And so uh, I happened to stumble upon a hypnotist who hypnotized me one time and I felt this sense of peace and calm almost immediately. And I got really interested on in what it was. I was skeptical at first, but open-minded, thank goodness, because your biggest breakthroughs are often hidden in the places you don't want to go. And, uh, and then I found that hypnosis was an incredible tool to unlock the power of your unconscious mind. And so it's been three decades now, and I actually have facilitated 15,000 individual hypnosis sessions over this period, and it helped me to unlock the secrets of our mind, and I'm here to share some of those secrets with you today. There's a lot of people skeptical, like, oh, we shouldn't open up, especially those that are, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, have faith that would say, ooh, don't open your mind to this kind of thing or that, someone else controlling things. What do you say to that? I say that you're correct. You shouldn't just allow yourself to be open to somebody who might have poor intentions, right? However, I also believe that uh, learning how to train your brain is a very powerful and useful skill to possess. It's what emotional intelligence is all about. Uh, If religion is involved, uh, the biggest um, thing that the devil ever did was get people not to use hypnosis, (laughs) right? Because he doesn't want you learning how to tap into these God-given tools that we have of, because really Hollywood makes hypnosis look like you can put people in trances and make them do whatever, but that's not what it is, or I wouldn't be doing that, right? So um, it's really about understanding how your beliefs that you develop when you're a kid are still driving your behavior as an adult today. It's influencing your money, your marriage, your health, your priorities, those beliefs that we developed when we were eight-year-old kids. And hypnosis gives you access to those beliefs so that you can upgrade them. So it's practical, it's loving, it's empowering, and uh, and it's the fastest way to create change. Well, you know, I've got so many questions for you. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I, I guess I'll go my original way here to kind of give overall overview. But I want to come back to personal, like we talked about before this, of you know, kids that went through this pandemic time frame and avoided and all that kind of stuff, because I think there's a lot of people, a lot of leaders that, you know, think of, of things they want to do to shift their mindset or be able to deal with, you know, uh, challenges they're facing. But I think we all, we have kids too that are uh, are challenged or kind of avoiding, uh, you know, key issues today. Let's, um, let's jump in here to this One Belief Away book. And you, you said something about how, you know, entrepreneurs and business leaders, they get stuck, they get stressed, they get overwhelmed, they struggle to make ba- breakthroughs, and they're often in f- you're not solving the right problems. In fact, they often have mental malware. malware. Tell us about it. 
So we all have had computers where we accidentally downloaded some kind of virus and now all of a sudden our email's not working, right? And we could have the best computer, but if we download that virus, then it's not going to allow those programs to run optimally. Well, human beings have an operating system as well. And we also download malware. I call it mental malware. And those are beliefs like, I'm not good enough. I have to be a perfectionist. Uh, you can't trust people, right? All kinds of beliefs that cause us to feel like we're not enough or you can't trust others. And those beliefs usually are what sabotage leaders, which is why you and I both talk so much about trust. But if you don't upgrade those beliefs that are causing you to not to trust yourself or others, you can't get there, right? And so- yeah. And so well, how do you um, do that? It's like, man, changing a belief like you've had this belief since childhood or you, I've had this belief since whatever. And I'm like, I, I can even be aware. I like, you know, for me, it's like, oh, I want to be more patient. I mean, some of the drivenness is what helped us, you know, change, change lives, change people. But sometimes I want to like, let me pull back here. You know, it's it's like, Lord, help me be patient and help me be patient right now. You know, it's, it's like, right? but let's just say that's that's when like, I, I how do I how do I actually change a belief that I'm, I'm there, I'm stuck in it, I know it even, I might even be aware of it. Yeah, well, it's, it's easy to do. Let me unpack this for you real quick with that very example you just gave. See, our brain is always trying to avoid pain and gain pleasure. It's built into us and we will want to avoid pain more than anything else. So one of the things that you just said, David, was that you know I might wanna be patient. However, that energy is also what made me successful. And after working with a lot of high powered CEOs and C-suite execs, I found that a lot of times we don't wanna give up that impatience or that drive because we think it's our mojo. And if we give it up, we're gonna somehow lose what allowed us to become successful, which is not the case. It's actually just an evolution because you and I both know that what got us here won't get us there, right? So we've got to evolve, but it's hard to do that if. You won't upgrade a belief because you think that it's somehow still serving you. So we go either, you know, black or white. It's got to be this way or that I'm patient or I'm not patient. But there's always option C, you know, the third option where we have that new way of, of uh, having a belief where I'm patient because I want to be open to the feedback of others and I want to be kind and I want to build trust. And you do that by being patient and sometimes taking a breath and slowing down. Like if you're on ice, I live in the Midwest. When it snows, it gets icy outside. That's not the time to slam on the acceleration pedal, right? Because you're, you're burning your wheels, but you ain't going anywhere. It's time to take the foot off the gas and slow things down. Well, we can do both. There's a time to engage and accelerate, and then there's a time to take your foot off the pedal. So we just want to evolve our beliefs and get clear so that your brain, it will not release a belief if it thinks it's protecting you or if it thinks it's serving you in some positive way. And if you can get clarity around that, like if you have a belief that you can't trust people, you and I both know that is not, you might say, yeah, well, it keeps you from getting hurt, but it also keeps you from building the relationships that you will need to be able to take your results to the next level. And so that's why the conflict comes in where people have a hard time letting go of the old beliefs, it's because it's still serving them. And what we would do is shift that around. Hey, it's Ann with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true to life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. How long does it take to shift a belief? A couple of minutes. Wow. Yeah, people, people will, and it stays shifted. Like once you understand that the world is round, not flat, you know, and you have that experience, you can't go back to thinking the world's flat anymore. Right. You know, it just doesn't, you just don't believe that anymore. Right. And so. Yeah. So people think that, oh, you got to do all this work and it takes 21 days and it takes years to change beliefs. That's not been my experience. And I was in the trenches doing 60 sessions a week for decades, you know, working with every kind of person there was with every kind of, you know, whether we're growing your company or I'm getting people off uh, cocaine and heroin and, you know, as a psychologist, and, as a yeah. psychologist. Yeah. All the, yeah. Well, so I have my master's degree in psychology and I was working towards my doctorate, but I found that 
tools like uh, hypnotism, neuro-linguistic programming, the peak performance tools that uh, were helping people with post-traumatic stress, which is what I was most interested in in the beginning. I wasn't really interested in helping people to grow companies or how do you get people to get along after a merger? Or, I mean, I wasn't that wasn't my forte. You know, I was a kid that grew up in cornfields. I didn't care about that. <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, that was my evolution as I had more, uh, you know, CEOs coming to see me for a variety of problems. And they're like, Hey, you think you could hypnotize my sales team to close more sales? <laughs> and I'd be like, okay. Right. But that wasn't my forte. So in the beginning it was helping people with anxiety, post-traumatic stress. I worked with a ton of veterans and I was the guy that you went to when nothing else worked. Right. I was the last resort hypnotist you know, that people went to, and then we got amazing results. And so those tools were what I went for. And, and I found that they work just so much faster and better than cognitive behavioral therapy and this desensitization. So I probably went into that a little bit farther than oh, you this wanted. This is great. Tell yeah. you know, I want, I want to get an example sometime, but let's first step into the five-step strategy for getting unstuck. This is something we can talk about right now. Yes. Plenty of people are, feel stuck, whether it's yeah in uh, their work or business or the leaders we're talking to today, or maybe in their marriage or family or life, right? So right. can you give us a little hint on this? I know we'd like to read no more. We're going to put everything uh, in the snow uh, snow notes. Here we go, Minnesota word, <laughs> in the show notes, timsure.com and all the places you can find everything about Tim, his books, even if you want to uh, connect with him in deeper ways, have him come speak to your group. But let's um, let's just jump into an overview of this five-step strategy and get get some value right now. Yeah. So start with the feeling, right? So what are you feeling? You know, instead of what are you thinking, what are you feeling? You know, are you feeling uh, stress, pressure, overwhelm, uncertainty? You know, if you, it's usually a negative emotion that people are wanting to change when they're feeling stuck. Are you procrastinating? What is it that you're feeling? Then I want you to ask yourself, what would I have to believe to feel this way? Because our beliefs create our feelings and then our feelings determine how we behave. So if you start with the feeling and then you say, all right, well, I'm feeling this stress right now, this pressure, what would I have to believe in order to feel this way? Well, I'd have to believe, I guess, that maybe it's not going to work out or we don't have the, the power to be able to, you know, the resources to be able to figure this out or there's too much uncertainty. So when the pandemic broke out, David, uh, I started doing programs for fire chiefs around the country because I was already doing their conventions and teaching leadership skills for fire chiefs, the soft skills, and, uh, and they really needed it in this time of uncertainty. And a lot of chiefs were overwhelmed because they were afraid they weren't going to have the supplies, the mass, what they needed to be able to take care of everybody. And uh, they were really stressed out. And so, you know, the belief was that we're not going to be able to handle it. You know, something bad is going to happen. So then what we ask ourselves is, what would you want to believe instead? What would you rather believe instead? And that simple, you know, shift from focusing on what we're afraid of to focusing on what we want to have happen causes your brain to pay attention to a completely different set of information that's in your awareness that you might not be paying attention to because you have infinite potential. You could make so many decisions right now in this moment. You can keep listening to the podcast. You go to the bathroom, you get something to eat. You could talk to a friend. You could get on a plane and go to Vegas. You have so many things that you could do but your brain doesn't pay attention to all of that. It pays attention to whatever your belief is. And then it causes you to look for evidence that supports that particular belief, which is why it's so important to pay attention to the beliefs that you have, which hardly anybody ever does that because we're relying on our logical analytical mind. We're not paying attention to our unconscious mind, which actually controls 80% of what we do, right? And so those beliefs are like, programs that are running in our mind and they cause us to focus on what we uh, what we expect to have happen. So if we're having a fear that we're overwhelmed and we're not going to be able to work it out, then our brain is finding all these reasons for why it's not going to work out. And what you focus on expands. What you think about comes about. Whatever you focus on most of the time, your life becomes. So when you shift from what I'm really afraid of is that it's not going to work out, or I can't trust that my people are going to work it out, or maybe I'm not sure what's going to happen and I'm not sure what to do. And that's the bigger fear. 
is then if I don't look like I'm in control, what are people going to think of me? Am I going to lose my credibility? Are people going to start to mistrust me? Are people going to feel like maybe I'm not the right person for the job and I'm going to lose my job, right? And if I lost my job, what would happen then? You know, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to, you know, where would I find another job? And a lot of times we start digging deep in the middle of the night. It's usually in the middle of the night when we start having these worries and fears, you know, of uh, all the what ifs. And so when you ask yourself, all right, what would I rather have happen? What would I want to believe in this situation? If you can believe anything, because a belief is just an opinion. It's not a fact. So, well, I'd want to believe that it's going to work out. I want to believe that our people are going to rally, that we're going to find a solution, that we're going to figure out a way, that I'm going to be able to rise to the occasion, that I'm going to end up stronger and wiser and more effective and people believe in me even more. And I'm going to believe in myself even more because of this situation. It's just an opportunity to grow and become more effective. Well, if that's what you're focusing on, then all of a sudden you start to feel more confident, more secure. Okay. And then of course, then you would ask yourself, step four and five would be, all right, well, if I was feeling this new feeling of confidence and there was a new opportunity because I'm thinking in a new way, what would be a big step that I would make? What would be a bold move that I would take? What's a big domino move where you push down one domino and it knocks all the other ones down? I might have that conversation, that difficult conversation. I might call that customer up. I might sit down and have that talk or have that apology or get together with different uh, department heads and have just a creativity session. You know, it would be a big uh, move that I could make that would create some momentum or, you know, get some things cleared out instead of swept under the carpet. Once you get clear on what your big move would be, then step five is act on it, put it into action. And that, process. You can go through it in a matter of minutes, right? But you're starting with the feeling. What's the fear that I'm having? What would I have to believe in order to have that fear? What would I rather believe instead, which is number three? Number four is what's a big, bold move that I would make with this new belief in mind? And then number five, take action on that big, bold, new action. So I, this is very interesting. I can hear some people saying, wow, that seems tremendous. I could do that with myself. But what you when you said um, your team, like you know, I know some people would say our a big problem for leaders is they don't confront the brutal facts. Like that person is failing; they aren't dealing with it. And you're in it in in that one situation with others. When I trust others, I trust them for what they do consistently, right? If they're late all the time, it would be kind of crazy to trust that they're all of a sudden going to be on time. It would be like that's that doesn't make sense. Correct. So let's say I've got this person outside of me. I want to believe in them to you know do this new thing. I so want that for them. I hope it for them. But my my uh, you know mind would say, that's not been my experience. That would be stupid to believe that. So how do I get that? You know, I want a uh, number three. Uh, what would I want to believe? I'd want to believe that they're going to succeed and they're going to do this. But I do have this skepticism in that because it just hasn't made sense in any experience I've had. So, you know, it. how yeah. do I deal with that? Excellent. Outstanding question. So, all right. So in that situation, the first thing we did was we focused on what we can do instead of what we want others to do. We focused on what can I do so I can be the cause instead of the effect, right? What Instead of what's going to happen, what can I bring to the situation? Then in that specific example, David, what we would do is if you feel like somebody is slipping, what we do is we have a conversation with them and we try to figure out what their belief is that's driving that behavior. If you become someone who is always looking for beliefs, you will find them. And those beliefs are what's driving everything. If somebody's always late, they might have a belief that they need to get a couple more things in before they get to the office and it always throws them off, off right? Or maybe they have a belief that they're dropping the ball now. And because they're dropping the ball, they feel all this internal pressure, all this stress, which is wearing them out, causing them to drink at night, causing them to not sleep good. Then they wake up tired and then they've been doing this for months. So now they're all wore out and they're just dreading that for that phone call that you're fired. And that kind of fear usually causes people to shut down instead of step up. But if you were able to recognize that that was going on, you could help upgrade that belief and give them a new sense of energy create some collaborative partners with them to help them succeed and believe in them. And that builds trust. And it also 
uh, helps you to be able to get to the root of the issue instead of trying to deal with the symptoms that are happening, like procrastination or showing up late and things like that. Those are symptoms. So find the beliefs and you will find your solutions. Hmm. That's, that's the takeaway. Find your beliefs and you will find your solutions. Let's jump. So that's a five-step strategy for getting unstuck. Uh, and it seems like that might overlap with what I was going to ask before with, let's say, a, you know, a kid in the pandemic that didn't do their homework, that's a good performer, but that avoided it. Or, you know, uh, many people listening are parents of children that maybe their ch their child isn't doing exactly what they hope for and they see it taking them down the wrong path. Anything you would add to that situation? Yeah, again, a lot of times we don't know how to make ourselves feel safe. And so one of the ways that you can help people to feel safe is to help them do a two-step process where you use power breathing and you ask a power question. So power breathing is when you take, uh, you breathe through your nose, you breathe down to your belly, then you slowly exhale. You do that five times in a row. It takes less than a minute, but you're just literally just sitting there and breathing through your nose. Most of us under pressure breathe through our mouth which actually makes us feel more stressed inside. So breathing through your nose and then slowly exhaling, it causes us to slow down. And when you do that five times in a row, it activates your brain's relaxation response. So you actually get a little hit of dopamine and it makes you feel better. So you've got built-in antidepressants in your brain already. You don't have to take anything. You just use your power breathing. Once you slow down, then you focus on asking a power question. What is the outcome that I want? What resources do I have? Who can I lean on for support? Um, how do I want to feel right now? What's one way I could feel that way that would make me feel good about myself afterwards? Like I could go eat a bunch of junk food, but then I won't feel good afterwards. But I could, you know, take a walk, listen to a motivating video on YouTube, you know, and then all of a sudden I start to believe in myself and feel like this is possible. And then it shifts how you feel and it shifts what you focus on. So usually just giving people resources helps tremendously. Are those power questions in one of your books or do you have a handout we can throw in here on, with them? Yeah, I'll send you a handout that you can uh, with samples of power questions. So I'll get you that. And then, yes, these are in my book, uh, The One Belief Away and also the Get Out of Your Way books have those power questions. Get out of your way, books. We'll put all these in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. I'll tell you, one of the uh, fastest ways, though, really, um, that I take people through isn't really just asking them questions, because that can shift pretty quickly, uh, because you're using your conscious mind, you're shifting what you're focusing on, which immediately makes you feel more secure. And if we feel safe, it's amazing what people can accomplish. It's amazing what we can get through, right? So Marcus Aurelius once said that every obstacle in your path is just fuel for your fire. <laughs> it's just fuel for your fire, right? Yep. And so, yeah. And so, um, uh, but really what I tend to do is I start with that feeling and I have them follow that feeling back to the very first time they ever had that feeling. And almost everybody, David, goes back to some point when they were a kid, when that belief was initially formed. And so that's why you can upgrade a belief and it's sustainable because when I take people through that experience, it shifts how they're feeling. It's like going back and changing the memory that you have. So instead of striking out at the big game or when you ask someone to go on a date and they said no, or your best friend asked them out, you know, behind your back. And, you know, when we go through those little traumas that we go through and those beliefs are formed, it's like going back and rewriting the memory and upgrading the belief. It's not the experiences you go through. It's the beliefs that form, that influence you. You know, Wayne Dyer used to say that if you get bit by a snake, the snake bite hurts, but it's the venom that's inside of you. That's what paralyzes you. The goal is to get the venom out. And we all have these blind spots, these biases, these bad habits that were formed inside of us as a way of surviving when we were young. And some of them are very helpful, but some of them are very destructive. And it's, our goal is to get the poison out as an adult. Hey, it's Sam from the Trust Edge team. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root issue hindering your organization. That's where Trust Edge coaching certification comes in. Trust Edge coaches are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results in a culture where people actually want to make an impact. 
So whether you're a coach with your own clients or a leader training people inside your organization, check out TrustEdgeCoaching.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your business. And now back to the show. You talked about something, you know, uh, you called it achiever syndrome. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. Well, you and I are achievers and everybody that listens to your program is an achiever, <laughs> right? We are people who believe we can make the world a better place, right? And we want to offer value and we want to help people and we want to grow and we want to see how far we can take it. We want to see if we can set these crazy goals and then actually pull them off. And part of that in the beginning usually comes from a fear of not being good enough or trying to prove ourselves or having a chip on our shoulder because someone told us we couldn't do something and we're like, oh yeah, watch me, <laughs> right? And so a lot of it in the beginning, it, it shifts when we're older, but now we want to do it because we want to add value. But in the beginning, it often started from anxiety, right? That fear that we're not going to be able to do it. And so it keeps us working harder and pushing harder and uh, sacrificing our health or relationships or friends or other activities because we've got to work and we got to achieve this goal and we've got to make it happen. And sometimes we get to a point where it feels like we've built this giant hamster wheel. And although it's powerful and people admired it, now we feel like we can't get off of it or everything's going to fall down around us. Right. And so I call that achiever syndrome because now that anxiety that allowed us to be able to perform and achieve goals is the same kind of anxiety that now it doesn't matter what we achieve and what we accomplish. It never feels like it's enough. And we never feel like we can be content or even take a day off without our mind going a thousand miles an hour. So it's a, it's a new way of being able to evolve so that instead of playing not to win, we're learning how to play or we're instead of playing not to lose, because that's often how we start. We're trying not to lose. We start to shift to playing to win. And we start to realize that how we win is through helping others win. And it's not so self-focused anymore. And, you know, that's the whole idea behind your trust empire that you've brought so much good into the world by teaching people how to trust each other. And of course, the only way you can do that is by trusting yourself first. Yeah. So let's take someone, a senior executive, they've got achiever syndrome. Sure. They're I dying. I have one senior leader, uh, head of one of the biggest top 10 companies, a, a big portion of the one of the biggest uh, companies in the world. Yeah. And uh, we're in private, in public, he is hard as nails. He yeah. is tough. He is, he won't let anybody in. Yeah. Privately, there's been some really cool things that have happened, but I still remember when he said, David, I, I feel I wake up with a pit in my stomach with the weight yeah. of this organization on my back. Mm -hmm. um, what do what do you do with that? What, how do you help them move from there? What would you do? It's very common. When you have a high level position, you put on the show. That's kind of what we call, we put on the show, right? So hard as nails or, you know, nothing bothers you. It just rolls off your back. And then you come home and you have the divorces and the addictions and, you know, all the, because, human beings aren't made to have that kind of pressure and that kind, unless they snap and they become narcissistic. Right. And, and, but most people, um, it was just set up that way. You know, either they were raised by a family member that was that way, or that's what they learned growing up, you know, from the bottom up. And, uh, that's what they learned and it's exhausting, but we're afraid to, uh, take our emotional armor off, as Brene Brown would call it. We're afraid to remove that emotional armor because um, that's how you die. And it literally will feel like life or death. You know? And so in that situation, what I do is I take them through the awakening process again. I, I take them through that, that feeling of responsibility, that feeling of pressure, and I track it back. And I guarantee he would end up going back to some time in his childhood where that belief of who he had to become to get love formed. Hmm. And so, you know, the reason that people just don't let go of that stuff is because it does feel like life and death. And it literally, you don't talk about love very much. I mean, not you. I mean, just in general, business people don't talk about love very much, but it is what rules human beings. 
you know, our need for that love and attention. And if we don't feel like we're going to get it, how do I get it? And we develop all kinds of strategies, some that make us uber wealthy and successful. But the flip side of that is that pit in your stomach, having a hard time getting out of bed, feeling, you know, in the middle of the night, like, how can I have all of this and still be unhappy? What's wrong with me? And, uh, and I can't let it show because, you know, people will take me down as soon as they see any weakness, which is true. There will be people that are just waiting to, you know, see that crack in the armor uh, because they're using a similar strategy to get what they want. So we would go and we would actually make that person even stronger by upgrading their sense of their deep sense of self-love and self-acceptance and a feeling of peace, because then they can feel safe without the armor, which is a whole new trip. And people that are waiting for that armor, when the armor comes off, they don't know how to handle someone like that. So they go usually after someone else. So it even fends off your enemies, you know, just by you developing this new sense of self-love and self-acceptance. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm able to do that because I spent decades doing that, you know, with so many people uh, with so much emotional armor. Tell us uh, right here. I've got a few more questions I've got to ask you, even though we're, uh, we're, we've gotten so much already. But before we uh, get to those last uh, couple of questions, you are, you know, we're, we're going to give all of the places to find out about you in the show notes. Tell us about the free program, Power of the Unconscious Mind, that you're giving our listeners today. And tell us uh, out loud also where to find that, powermindsetprogram.com, and anywhere else you especially would would uh, allow people to reach out to you. Well, thank you, David. That's very kind of you. So I created a, a program called The Power of Your Unconscious Mind because so many people don't really understand how their mind works. And so I put together a really fun program that starts off with a lot of cool stories from all the clients experiences. You can imagine as a hypnotist, all, you know, 30 years of clients, some of the experiences that I've had. <laughs> and so I talk about a lot of those experiences and how powerful um, just everyday normal people are, you know, with the power we're walking around inside of us, we just don't know how to use it. It's kind of like having a big steel safe and you only know two numbers of the three number combination feels like that door is never going to open. You're never going to get that treasure. But if you have that third number, that door swings right open. It's like, hey, there it is, right? Real easy. And that's what this program teaches you. It teaches you how your mind works and it gives you all these cool little uh, shortcuts or mind hacks, you know, that will help you to use the power of your mind to create your life by design. So if you go to powermindsetprogram.com, uh, all your listeners for this amazing podcast will get a free copy. Love it. Thank you yeah. so much for that, Tim. Yeah, of course. And thanks for being here today. And uh, a couple questions I want to ask is just, you know, you and I um, get the unique opportunity to walk next to some pretty amazing leaders and have some some pretty significant influence in spite of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, what... How do you lead yourself? I'm always curious about, I, I, you know, it's, it's, we talk here a lot because we're on big stages a lot. How do, am I going to be the same on stage as I am off stage? How do I, what are the routines so that I stay having a healthy, vibrant marriage and being a good dad and also leading my team well? But what routines do you have to be healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, or, you know, with your team? What, what, what do you have a routine or two you would share? Well, I think the biggest secret for all of us is we surround ourselves with good people, right? People who want to make a difference, people who will give us honest feedback, uh, people that will put us in check if need be, which happens occasionally, <laughs> right? Yep. And so when you surround yourself with good people and good information, uh, I spend a lot of time reading, a lot of time listening to podcasts, a lot of time um, on YouTube, just listening to videos while I'm usually exercising. And it feeds your mind this positive energy. If you're not intentionally feeding your mind this positive energy, then it's going to feed off of whatever else is around you. And there's so much fear and insecurity that so much propaganda all around us that I don't want my mind munching on that. I want it munching on beliefs that say you're good, you're worthy, you're already enough. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to even make it about yourself. Make it about others. You know, go about your day making others feel like they're the coolest kid in the room, right? That you would pick them first on any team, you know, lift people up everywhere you go. 
And uh, I also, you know, I, one of my uh, favorite books here is on my desk. I wanted to hold this one up too. So it's called Trusted Leader, Eight Pillars That Drive Results. Because I saw one of your interview questions was, what's one of your favorite books that you've been reading lately? Yeah. And I looked on my desk and your book was sitting there. I thought, oh, well, that was pretty easy. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So if you haven't got Trusted Leader, get that one and Trusted Edge. Awesome yeah. books. I love them. Thank you. And I love how you wrote them and how they're laid out because it makes it feel easy to read when you're a, someone, I don't like the word busy. I like the word in demand. So when you're in <laughs> demand, you don't have time to read a bunch of books. So it makes it easy. So thank you for doing that. Well, so that's And good. then have some mentors. I've been really lucky uh, the last year. Um, I've spent a lot of time with uh, Dennis Waitley, Dr. Dennis Waitley, who wrote The Psychology of Winning and, and uh, I've spent a lot of, he's 87 years old and we spent a lot of time together and he is like one of the most successful motivational speakers that ever lived. He almost kind of started the movement uh, with um, Conan, uh, Knight and Conangale, right? No, Nightingale Conan, <laughs> Earl Nightingale kind of launched his career. And so, and he's still, the last time we talked last week, he's talking about the power of, of not making assumptions, negative assumptions and assuming the best in others and keeping our ego in check. And how can I brighten someone else's day? You know, he's still at 87, always trying to make himself better. And he's just been a really amazing influence for me this last year. That was, that's, well, we got the resource question. We got the, the, the uh, have mentors. What's one, you know, one best piece of advice, one more, like, do you have a tag piece of advice that you'd say, here's something I would do right now, everybody? Yeah, I would say that your biggest breakthroughs are hidden in the places you don't want to go. So look at where you're resisting, where you're putting things off, where you feel uncomfortable. And then that's where you need to go. Because when you go in that direction, you're uncovering the belief that will allow you to make a huge breakthrough in your life. Because when you upgrade a belief, it literally upgrades the information in your sphere around you. You know, everything we're like, we live in this digital world, you know, your mind can pay attention to so many different possibilities. And when you upgrade a belief, you tune into a new set of information that you hadn't noticed before. And that new information will help you to achieve the goal that you have faster than how you are probably trying to do it on your own, right? So when we have prosperity, success, abundance, it's not something that you collect. It's something that you tune into. And the fastest way to tune into it is find where you resist, figure out what the belief is, and start to upgrade it. And the One Belief Away book will help you. Or if you want faster results, reach out to my office and, and we'll get it done in less than an hour. And uh, you'll find yourself creating momentum and magic in your life that will blow your mind no matter how successful you are. Tim, sure. Thank you so much. Well, I think we answered your, your we, we have one more question. Remember all the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. I ask this, you might say it's Dennis Waitley, but I'm going to ask it again because it's our final question. And that is, it's a trusted leader show. Who is a leader? Maybe you have another one that you trust, most trust and why? Yeah, Troy Hanna. He was president of Central Restaurant Products and now he's president of another company. And when I first got into working with, um, with companies. Uh, he taught me things like what EBITDA is and, you know, margins and KPIs and, you know, I, was, I didn't know what any of that stuff was. Right. And, and he really kind of took me under his wing and showed me what a people centric uh, culture oriented uh, leader is like. He was very transformational. He was very transactional, but he was very transformational as well. You know, he's very good. He started as a sales guy and then worked his way up the ranks. And then, you know, that company almost doubled its profitability in the five years that him and I worked together. It was pretty extraordinary. And uh, I just learned so much from him because he would tell me the truth and he would be very focused on the results that we were going to get. But he was also open to growing. And, you know, one of the coolest things that ever happened, uh, uh, is I would go sit in his office. And when we first sat down, it was just him and his desk and his paper, paperwork, right? And files he had to go through. You know, a couple of years into it, I went in there and there was pictures of his family all over the desk, right? He had never showed that side of himself before. He had never talked about his kids, his wife, anything like that. And one of the best comment or uh, compliments I ever received, and I've had a bunch of them, but he said, you didn't just make us a better company. You made us better people. 
And I'm like, that's so Troy Hanna, he's a rock star. That's fantastic. Well, there has more we could cover, but uh, Tim sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this time together. That's the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted.